Hiya folks, uh, I got another question from the mailbag that I'm going to read to you. In the practice of Zen, does one need to both study Zen and practice Zazen, or is the practice of Zazen sufficient? This came to mind a moment before a chapter on it came up. The chapter described the study of Zen and the practice of Zazen as two methods or routes to the same thing. Wow, it sounded Canadian when I said routes. routes. Perhaps two manifestations of the same thing. It doesn't seem like they would be the same, as Dogen, I believe, described that one shouldn't study Buddhism without a teacher, but practicing Zazen is all right alone. Though perhaps both point in the same direction. Perhaps this is a difference where some groups are more focused on Zazen and others more on koans, though neither is completely devoid of either practice, thus at least a little bit of studying is assumed alongside Zazen practice. Well, that's kind of it. A little bit of Zazen is assumed, no, a little bit of studying is assumed alongside Zazen practice. The main thing in the Zen form of Buddhism is Zazen, is the practice of Zazen. Study is a, a whole other realm, I think, and I'll just tell you what I can tell you about it. For one thing, there's no sort of Buddhist canon, at least not in the Zen form of Buddhism. The only form of Buddhism that I know that has a canon, like a set of scriptures that are considered to be the authentic scriptures and none outside of that are considered authentic, is the Theravada tradition, who value the Pali canon, which is the earliest uh, scriptures. Well, actually, these days uh, there's some dispute about whether they're the earliest ones, but for a long time they were the earliest known scriptures of Buddhism, and the Theravada sect considers those to be authentic and everything else to be, you know, not authentic. In the Zen tradition, there are all kinds of scriptures that are considered authentic. And, and just kind of as a little aside, this whole idea of a canon is an interesting bit of history because the, the Christians were the first ones to come up with the idea of canonizing written scriptures. Uh, even, even the Jews didn't have a canon of written scriptures before the Christians came up with one that included the Jewish scriptures, and then the Jew, Jewish uh, tradition tended to follow the Christians in, in what they included in their version of the Jewish scriptures, which is interesting. And then, of course, the Muslims followed the Christians in, in the same idea of making a canon of scriptures. Uh, the Hindus and Buddhists never really did that. I, I mean, there are the Vedas and the Upanishads in Hinduism, but there's all sorts of literature that's sort of, you know, there's, there's some things that are considered by almost everybody to be authentic and some things that are only considered by certain sects to be authentic. Sa same thing happens in Christians. You know, the Book of Mormon is only really considered to be authentic by the Mormons, but, you know, there's... Uh, things like that. And also there's tons of Gospels. Anyway, I'm getting off the track. In Buddhism, in the Zen form of Buddhism, really the Heart Sutra is pretty much universal in all sort of versions of Zen. Uh, most versions of Zen revere the Lotus Sutra, but not a lot of them read it. I've never read the Lotus Sutra from cover to cover. Uh, Lankavatara Sutra is sort of considered uh, more or less canonical because Bodhidharma was supposed to have revered it. And that's about it. Then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that is out there. In fact, I have heard that the Zen tradition has more written scriptures than any other tradition, which is ironic for a tradition that considers its founder to be Bodhidharma, who supposedly said, a special transmission outside the scriptures, no dependency on words and letters, pointing directly to the human mind, seeing into one's nature and attaining Buddhahood. So that sounds like uh, somebody who really didn't value scriptures very much. But there's a whole lot of written stuff in Zen, in the Zen tradition. Now, it's not important for you to memorize this and know this. Like, like uh, let's take an example. If you're a Christian and you don't know who Job was, or you don't know how many days Jesus stayed in the tomb, or you know you can't name at least three or four apostles, you're not much of a Christian. In the Zen tradition, there's no equivalent to that. There's no, there's no set of things that you're expected to know. Well, expected to know. Let me qualify that. If somebody comes up to me and says, hi, I'm a Zen Buddhist, I would expect them to know the Heart Sutra. I would expect them to know the basic life story of Buddha, as you know, most people uh, re remember it or you know 
reconstruct it. Um, I'd expect them to follow the ten precepts. I'd expect them to maybe not be able to, you know, rattle off the ten precepts or the eightfold path off the top of their head. I, I, I can't do it. I always have to look at something to, to jog my memory. But I, I'd expect them to understand what the precepts are and understand why you should follow the precepts. Uh, but as far as, like, just going through the mountain of Zen literature and studying it and memorizing it, there's no, there's no real reason. However, I will say that in my own case, Buddhist philosophy has been very useful. Uh, Nishijima Roshi used to talk about that. He used to say, study Buddhist philosophy, and he told me to write about Buddhist philosophy. So that I thought he thought I should write about Buddhist philosophy. I'm like, what? But Buddhist philosophy has been very helpful, and the reason is it, it forms a kind of a buttress, is buttress the right word, for the practice. So as you practice zazen, when you first start practicing zazen, the most you're going to experience is probably mind-numbing boredom. And not even mind, maybe mind, not mind-numbing boredom, but boredom for sure. Uh, you know, maybe frustration, maybe you'll get a little bit of inner peace and calm, and you know, if you're lucky. But that's what it'll be like for the first few years. After a while, though, if you continue this practice and continue working with it more and more, it's going to challenge your view of reality. You're, you're going you're gonna to be sitting there, and reality is going to start looking different to you. Maybe not physically different, you know, it's not going to be all technicolor and weird or something like that, but uh, the understanding that most people have about reality is going to not be your understanding anymore. The problem is if you're doing a lot of practice without studying the philosophy and then things start to look like that to you, then you start to see evidence, for example, that consciousness or awareness or whatever you want to call it is not localized in you, it can be weird. And people have a very hard time with it sometimes if they come into it unprepared without having kind of read anything about it. They'll start experiencing it and they don't know what to do with it. And it, it, it could make you feel like you're going crazy or it could make you feel like you've just discovered the thing that no one else has ever discovered before in history. And then you go, you know, shouting on the street about it. Uh, neither of those two approaches is really good. It's good to know that other people have no notice this and that there is a philosophy behind it and a kind of set of explanations because as Nishijima Roshi often used to say people like to have explanations and it does help to have explanations even though the explanations are always sort of provisional there, there's no sort of final explanation that's one of the things I kind of wasted a lot of time with was looking for the book that would have the final explanation I, when I was younger I thought that book must be out there you know and I keep reading and reading and reading and trying to find the final explanation in in a book and it just isn't out there but there are other people who've gone through this process before you have and have had some of the experiences that you will have or maybe that you already have had and that can talk about it in a way that you sort of feel like okay I'm not alone in this maybe I'm not crazy and maybe I'm not the Messiah maybe this is something that's common to a lot of humans and available to everyone and that's where study is useful but as far as kind of memorizing the scriptures or memorizing the stories or you know being able to rattle off the ten precepts or the eightfold path or whatever off the top of your head um, no real reason to do that as far as studying with a teacher that's an interesting point that Dogen makes and yeah, I think that's important. If you just kind of come to this in terms of just reading it, it's different from knowing somebody who's treaded the path before you and can kind of put it in her or his own words. Uh, and that can be important. But again, you can practice Zazen for years and read books for years before that will become a necessity. So you don't really, if you're just starting out, you don't have to worry that, oh my god, I better have a teacher before I even do this at all, or before I even read a book at all, or do Zazen at all. 
not necessary. There you go. That's study and zazen for you. I don't know if it made any sense, but if you'd like to contribute to me not making sense, you can contribute at the email, uh, no, at the URL that you're seeing on the screen. That's how I make my living. That's how I, you know, keep everything together. If you're having financial trouble, don't donate to me because I'm holding on. I'm just... <laughs> hanging in there so uh, but I am hanging in there because of you folks who kindly contribute all the time even the small contributions help have a good time all the time see you later bye